Shalom. I'm Muddle Balliston, and this is the fifth episode in our consideration of the subject matter about messianic prophecy. Messianic prophecy is important. It's important to every believer, everyone who would name the name of Jesus. Really, it is messianic prophecy that we all are banking on, prophecy that in the Old Testament looked forward to the coming of a Messiah, and that in the New Testament were fulfilled in Jesus of Nazareth. Now, in the first several episodes, we talked about why messianic prophecy is under attack, that people want to see it as allegory or people want to dismiss it. Um, liberal higher critics will dismiss it altogether. But we've seen that it's the really the, the building block of our confidence that the God who made a prediction in an earlier part of Scripture will fulfill it in a latter part of Scripture. That's our confidence. Jesus pointed during his life time of ministry here on earth. He pointed to these messianic prophecies as those which spoke of him. And so we don't take that lightly. We don't dismiss them. We don't try to change them. We don't see them as allegory. But whenever possible, they can be understood literally. And that's how we, we understand them. We had looked at an earlier section in Genesis in our last episode. We had looked at Genesis chapters 3 and 4 which were the first inklings of two things. Number one, that God would send the Messiah specifically in answer and in solution to the issue of mankind's fall. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, the Messiah was first promised in a very clear way as the answer to the fall of man. He would be the one who would ultimately come in, bring salvation, and crush the head of Satan. Then we saw in Genesis 4.1 the idea that Eve had, slightly mistaken as it was, that her first child would be the Messiah. She imagined that her firstborn son was now going to be the Messiah who would accomplish the task of bringing judgment upon Satan. That's why she says, I have gotten a child, Jehovah. She actually understood that the Messiah had to be divine. Therefore, she assigns the divine name of God to this child. It's a startling passage that most are unaware of. Little by little, God's going to pull back the curtain on messianic prophecy. He's going to reveal more and more. Uh, that's one of the basic concepts of Scripture. There is something called progressive revelation. This has nothing to, word, to do with politics or progressive politics but rather we progress in our understanding and in what God reveals. Progressive revelation is the concept that increasingly as time goes on, God reveals more and more of his prophetic program in Messiah Yeshua, in Messiah Jesus. So we see that the Messiah is going to be uh, first the son of the woman. He will be uh, the this this king, he will be born of a woman, and now in Genesis chapter 12, it further narrows down the identity by telling us to which group of people, to which nation shall he be born. And so I'm going to read a passage of scripture. It's very well known. It's one that I developed previously in some of the previous seasons of this program of Our Messiah is Jewish. I believe it was probably seasons one or two, we discussed at length the Abrahamic covenant. And that's what we're going to be discussing right now. This Abrahamic covenant, friends, is foundational. Um, I cannot emphasize that enough. It is foundational to our understanding as Christians, and yet it's there even though you don't know it. The foundational aspect of the, mess of the Abrahamic covenant is there. The Messianic, the, I'm sorry, the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant that God made with Abraham, forms the legal basis for the sending of the Messiah. Again, I'll restate that. The covenant that God made with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, is the legal basis for the coming of the Messiah. It's a promise he makes. 
So, this is part of the development of Messianic prophecy. That's why we're including it in this series, this, this season four of Our Messiah is Jewish, as we discuss Messianic prophecy. So here is the passage, very well known. The Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your father's house and from your relatives to a land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you I will curse. For through you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Again, the last phrase is, For from you, Abraham, Abram, all of the families of the earth, will be blessed. So in this passage, God is calling upon this, this nomadic sheep herder by the name of Avram. He's calling upon him to leave his father's household and leave the land Ur of the Chaldees at that point. And eventually he moved to Haran. He's calling him to leave a pagan land and go to the land which he will show you and I will make you a great nation. God is going to draw Avram out from the midst of the pagan people, going to separate him. He will be a separate people, and he will place him in the land that God will give to him. Now, here's a trick question. Sometimes I'll ask this if, if I'm a guest speaker in churches. Was Abraham... A Gentile or Jewish? By the way, the word Gentile simply is someone who is not ethnically Jewish. A person cannot become a Gentile. A person cannot become Jewish. I can't become Italian. Uh, I have visited Italy. It's a beautiful country. Um, I might even learn a few phrases of the language. I certainly enjoy the food, but I cannot ever become Italian. There are certain ethnic traits that I was not born into. And in fact, science tells us there are certain chromosomal distinctions that they now have identified that allow us to see these different ethnic groups, even to the extent where there are some diseases which tend to be more prevalent in certain ethnic groups. God makes a basic distinguishing mark here. He's going to call out a people who are going to be the nation of Israel. From this point forward, it will be ethnically descended. He's going to do this for the express purpose we see in verse 3. For through you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. That is the reason for the establishment of the Jewish people, because Abraham would be the first Jew. So in answer to my question, was Abraham Gentile or Jewish? Well, actually, until you have Jews, you don't have Gentiles. A Gentile is not an ethnic group. There's no, like, favorite uh, recipes of the Gentiles or the national flag or, you know, music. It's just simply a term to denote someone who is not ethnically Jewish. God calls Abram out of this pagan background, says to him, now you're the first Jew. I pronounce you as the first Jew. Ivri, as we say in Hebrew, and, and Abraham was this, this progenitor, this forefather of the Jewish people. However, not all of the line were to go through all of Abram's sons. Uh, Abram had many children, the most famous of whom were Ishmael and Isaac. Ishmael was chosen to be the one, the only one through whom the line would go. God had concern for, Ish, for, for Ishmael, but it was Isaac, the one and only son through whom the line would go. That's why God said, take your son, your only son, and go up to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. As far as God was concerned, Isaac alone was the son. Again, God had concern for Ishmael, and God has concern for the descendants of Ishmael the great Arab nations, and he has blessed them, will continue to do so. He gave them the land to the east of the land that he gave to the Jewish people. But to the people of Israel, 
God gave the land of Israel. There is no biblical dispute about that. And so here in Genesis 12, the Jewish people are established for the express purpose of bringing a blessing to all the families of the earth. All of the families of the earth desperately needed to be blessed because all of the families of the earth were caught in a cycle of sin and death and sin and death from which they could not escape. God had to step in dramatically into this intractable situation of being lost in sin. And he would ultimately do so through the Messiah. But as we saw in the last episode, that Messiah would be born of a woman. And here we're seeing in Genesis 12, the woman would be of a particular nation, of the nation of Israel. So Abram has these various children, most famous of which are Ishmael and Isaac. God shows his Isaac to be the one and only son through whom the Jewish line is going to go. We see that in First Chronicles. We see evidence of that. Isaac then has a number of children, the most famous of whom are Jacob and Esau. And we are all familiar with the passage which says, Jacob have I loved. Again, he had concern for Esau, but Esau had no concern for the things of God. Esau was willing to sell his, his birthright for a, for a bowl of stew. It was Jacob who would be chosen to, to lead the nation and to be the one and the only one through whom the Jewish line would go. So this promise that God makes to Abraham is to give him a nation, to give him a family. And the reason that he's calling this family into existence to be separate is not for their own benefit, but rather that they should benefit all of the nations of the earth. Now, why did all the nations of the earth need to be blessed? Just as we had said, they were caught in a cycle of sin and death. So how in the world would this help? Well, we've already seen that a Messiah had to be born. God chooses the Jewish nation to be the ones who would give birth to the Messiah. And so we see in this passage, I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you, I will curse. Verse 3, for through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Ultimately, through the Jewish people, specifically through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons. One of Jacob's 12 sons would be named Yehuda, Judah as you know him. The Messiah would be Ari Yehuda, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And ultimately, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus is born, and he is born of the tribe of Judah, and he is born to be Mashiach. He is born to be Messiah. And so God is going to use this Abrahamic covenant to ensure the birth of the Messiah, not just for the benefit of the Jewish people, but for the benefit of all of the nations. All of the nations desperately needed to be redeemed. Now, the Redeemer would ultimately come, as we saw in Genesis 3, and he would crush the head of Satan. Satan is no dummy. He doesn't want his head to be crushed. So Satan is going to try to thwart, to stop, to cut off the coming of the Messiah. Since Satan knows the scripture, he can quote the scripture as he did with Jesus in the wilderness temptation, he understands that the Messiah is going to be born of the Jewish people. Satan understands further that he can't fight against the Messiah directly. So what's the next best thing he attempts? He tries to cut off the line of people who are going to bring the Messiah. Hear that again. Satan is going to try to cut off the line of people, the Jewish people, who are going to give birth to the Messiah and who are going to bring, give the scriptures to the world. The scriptures were written by Jewish penmen. Satan hates the scriptures and he hates our Savior. So he's going to go up against the people group whom God chose to bring the scriptures and the Savior. 
Why? Why? Why do we see so much war in the Old Testament? What's happening? What's the scenario? What's going on behind the scenes? The answer is very simple. In each of these conflicts, we see the forces of Satan trying to cut off the line of the Messiah. Imagine for a moment that Pharaoh, Pharaoh of Egypt, had been successful in destroying the Jewish nation. He had drowned all of the male children. He had succeeded in decimating the line, ending the nation of Israel. Who then would never have been born? Jesus. He had to be born of the Jewish people. Satan does not want Jesus born. So what does he attempt to do? He attempts to cut off the line of the Jewish people. He is against the Jewish people. Satan is the greatest anti-Semite of all time. If you, through some mental foolish aberration, if you dip into the waters of anti-Semitism, if you start to spout anti-Semitic theories, if you are prejudiced in that way, then you are aligning yourself with Satan. It's very clear. It flows very logically. There are believers today who have humiliated themselves by repeating online, on social media, long discredited conspiracy theories against the Jewish people. These are the sorts of conspiracy theories that are, are spread by extremist websites that attempt to incite violence against all sorts of nationalities. Friends, this is a shameful thing. And yet I see believers repeating this foolish nonsense, imagining it to be some secret that they've uncovered. They're now going to share with the Christian community how satanic the Jews are. They're reading this directly from literature. It's the same type of literature that uh, you, you wear a tinfoil hat. Uh, and, uh, this is the so sort of conspiracy mindset that sees all of the world as, as somehow um, trying to keep things from you. And when you imbibe, when you involve yourself in these anti-Semitic theories, you're aligning yourself with the work of Satan because he has been the architect behind anti-Semitism because he wants to keep the Jewish people from bringing the Messiah. That's why we have so much war in the Old Testament, the attempt to cut off the line of the Messiah before Messiah could be born. Once that fails, Jesus is born, all the early apostles are Jewish, all the apostles are Jewish, all the early disciples are Jewish, hundreds of thousands of Jewish people eventually come to faith, they form the remnant of Israel. Satan failed in his first attempt. So what does he do? He's going to try to now keep the Messiah from returning, because when the Messiah returns is when the head of Satan is crushed. Remember that Genesis 3.15 imagery, that when the Messiah comes, Satan is able to bite and wound the heel, but eventually, through the eons of time, the heel keeps coming down and the head of Satan is crushed. And that will happen ultimately in future events at uh, the culmination of the kingdom. And so... Satan wants to prevent the return of the Messiah. How does he prevent the return of the Messiah? It's a complex thing, but let me shorten it to say this. Jesus himself gave the answer. He said to the Pharisees, to the Jewish leaders, he said, I'm going away. I've come as the king to the kingdom. Jesus came as the messianic king. He came to offer the kingdom to the people of the kingdom, the Jewish people. Ultimately, only a few of the Jewish people, a remnant, accepted him. A remnant did accept him. Praise God for that. But a majority rejected him. And so Jesus said, okay, you're sending me away. And I will not return until you, the Jewish leadership, look to the heavens and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. The same people who rejected the king, the king of the Jewish people and sent him away, are the same people who have to, to look to the heavens, recognize him whom they have pierced, as Zechariah says, and call for his return. 
It is the national repentance of Israel at the end of the tribulation that is the spark for the return of the Messiah and is the final end of Satan. Satan does not want that to happen. So what does he do? He attempts to thwart the idea that the Jewish people would ever call upon Jesus as their Messiah. Again, he tries, Satan tries to drive a wedge between the Jewish people and Jesus so that they never call upon him to ask him to return. What is that wedge? The wedge is irrational, foolish anti-Semitism perpetrated by people who are churchgoers and not Christians. Very simple. I'll stand by that forever because it's biblically true. Satan is the architect of anti-Semitism because, for instance, in the case of my own grandparents, born in Europe in the 1890s, all they knew from people who went to church were curses, angry words, threats of violence, and rocks being thrown at them. That's all they ever saw from church folk. Why? Because those church folk were not born-again believers in Jesus. Those church folk had a loyalty to a church institution and not to the person of Jesus the Messiah. They were being used in the overall plan of Satan to drive a wedge. Why in the world would my grandparents want to believe in this Jesus of the church when it seems that he motivated people to violence against them? That's the last one they would have wanted to believe in. They didn't have time to stop and ask these people about their theological orientation. No. Are you replacement theologians? Or no, That was not in view. They seemed to be Christian. They were wearing crosses around their neck. They went to church. So anti-Semitism has driven the Jewish people away from Jesus. When you ask, especially ask older Jewish people, my father's generation especially, why would you not believe in Jesus? And they would say, were you born yesterday? Do you not see what the Christians did to us? Violence, the pogroms, the Inquisition, the Holocaust, the Crusades. We have been trampled under their feet. Why should we want to believe in their religion? Again, the people doing these horrible things were not followers of the person or teachings of Jesus. They were people who were seeking to prop up a corrupt church institution. And I'll stand by those words as well. You and I, as born-again believers, need to understand that God calls the Jewish people to faith. He also calls you to befriend them, to be genuine friends of them, regardless of their initial reaction to what you might present about your own faith. This is what's happening, friends, in this Genesis 12, 3 passage. This is why God says, I will bless those who bless you. The one who curses you, I will curse. Why? Because he knew Satan would try to cut off and curse the Jewish people. So God says, the people who bless the Jewish people, I'm going to bless. Nations that have blessed the Jewish people have been blessed by God. They've known the blessings of God. Nations which have cursed the Jewish people are no more. Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, Nazi Germany. One by one, all of these were dealt with. We read about them in the history books. God has promised to preserve his people. Why? Because this Abrahamic covenant, Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, is a messianic prophecy. That's the whole point of this season. Messianic prophecy predicts the coming of the Messiah. Genesis 12, chapters, verses 1 through 3, predict the coming of the Messiah, not only for the Jewish people, but as verse 3 says, to bless all the peoples of the earth. If you are a believer in Messiah Jesus today, you have been blessed by the Jewish people, the people who gave the, the world the scriptures and who gave the world the Savior. Satan did not like the scriptures, Satan did not like the Savior, and he didn't like the people who produced the scriptures and the Savior, the Jewish people. 
but God has stood by us. God has preserved us against all odds. And God has promised that a day is coming when we will look upon him whom we have pierced and who all people have pierced, recognize him and call upon him for salvation. That's why Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, are an intrinsic part of Messianic prophecy. It predicts the coming of the Messiah. It identifies the family through which Messiah would come. It gives us reason to recognize that the God who made promises in an earlier part of Scripture, that God will keep them in a latter part of Scripture. The same God who made the promises and kept the promises are this, is the same God who makes promises to us and will keep those promises as well. Friends, this should be of great encouragement to us. Things can get discouraging in the short term. You may have circumstances around us, around you, that are certainly discouraging. Family problems, illness, all those things, I don't dismiss them. Uh, they are real, and we have to deal with them in the here and now. Ultimately, we are souls. We are those that are eternal because God has purchased and brought us into his family. If you are trusting in that renewed relationship as a daughter or son of God, you recognize that you've been purchased by the blood of Messiah. That has made you a person who will recognize God's love for Israel. It doesn't make you Jewish. You can never become Jewish. You don't become spiritually Jewish. All those are things we tackled in the first three seasons of our Messiah as Jewish. But it makes you, as Romans 11 says, part of the greater extended commonwealth. You are traveling along with us, just like Ruth did. Where you go, I will go. Where, where you die, I will be buried. Your God will be my God, your people, my people. Thank God he sent the Messiah for Jew and Gentile alike. Shalom, shalom. Shalom. 